Welcome. It's so good to be with you as we share church today. We are your hosts. I'm Ian. And I'm Eleanor. And we're going to guide you through our time of worship. The theme that we've got for today is friendship with Jesus. Jesus the King. And we are honoured to be his friends. Let's begin with prayer. Gracious Father, we bow in your presence, thanking you that you love us and care for us. You call us your friends and you act in friendly ways towards us. Oh, that we would respond appropriately and make you our best friend. So guide our time that we spend together now so that our friendship with one another will deepen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus is your friend, he is everything. And this song is just about that. He's everything to me. I trust you find every day that he is your everything, everything you need. Now, what are the things that are happening this week that we need to know about? The big thing is tomorrow we're saying our farewells to a very dear friend. Now, there's a 10 o'clock service at, is being held at the funeral parlour, but not everyone's able to go there. So we're going to set up the big screen and we will live screen that at the church uh, and everyone is welcome to come to the church at 10 o'clock. And then we'll be joined by the family who will arrive for a noon Thanksgiving service and a time of joy and celebration with them for John's life. A physical home group is scheduled for this Wednesday. Details on request. And then next Sunday is the 25th of April. It's Anzac Day. We will have a small memorial segment within our service that will be followed by our monthly mission morning tea and that'll be followed by mission prayer next Sunday. But every day we're in need of prayer. You have prayer points that you perhaps may or may not write down on paper, but there's certainly things that you want to pray about. 
So I'm going to grab these general thoughts and you can add your own specifics as I pray with you. Please bow with me. Father, thank you that you choose us to be your friends in a world that is falling apart, in a world where people hate you, where the world is your enemy. Thank you that you reach out in love and grace and mercy and care and you want to make friends. You've done everything you can to make friends and we want to be your friends. Oh, so Lord, we reach up to you and ask that we would have your wisdom and your grace and your mercy to live in such a way that we are an accurate reflection of your own nature and character, that we would do the things and say the things that are a clear expression of who you are and what you want to do in this world to fix up the mess that's here. And then there are our own friends and our own family members who are broken or who are hurting or who are struggling, and we lift them before you as well. Oh, Lord, befriend them, we pray. Care for them and their needs. Bind up their hurts. Soothe their troubles. And show them again and again that you love them and care for them and woo them and win them over to yourself that they might find that life with you is the best possible life. So we commit to you our world, our family, our friends, ourselves, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the ways in which we express our friendship is through our giving. We want to say thank you to those of you who partner with us. Uh, the top bank account there is a way in which you share through the wider ministry of the church and all that we do. And then the lower account is for those of you who wish to participate specifically and directly into the mission into Myanmar, formerly Burma. And we're able to partner uh, with the locals over there. So thank you for sharing with us in this regard. We have a song, a song that is the obvious song to fit with our theme today of friendship with Jesus. And the song is this beautiful hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
indeed he is the friend that we need every day. And our response is, oh, that we would have him speak to us, speak into our lives, speak into our circumstances, that we might hear all that he has to say to us. Speak, O Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you do speak to us. You speak to us directly. You speak to us through our earthly friends. And you speak to us through your word. And here is our scripture reading for today. It's found in Mark chapter 9. And it's a little reading from verse 30 to 32. We read of Jesus and his disciples. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because... He was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they didn't understand what he meant. And they were afraid to ask him about it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I'm on study leave at the moment, so rather than prepare a new sermon, we've gone back into the archives, and we're about to play for you uh, a sermon that was a popular one, one that was uh, recorded and then reviewed again and again and again from about six years ago. The, The message is from that scripture passage, Jesus and me, friends forever. Jesus and me, how long are we going to be friends? For a very, 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 very long time. Starting already, we're already friends. And our passage today from Mark chapter 9 
is going to help us to flesh that out a little bit. There's an old saying, you can't choose your family. Matter of fact, there are, there are some people in my family, I perhaps might not have chosen them to be there, but no name shall be mentioned at this stage. <laughs> you can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. And the great news is, God has chosen you to be his friend. He looked around and who would I like to be friends with? And he picked you. He really wants to be your friend. So how does friendship work? It's a bit like this. And, and with this, how come some people you can be friendly with and some people you can't? Well, let's start at the top left. The increasing quality of your friendships. So if you start over to the left, not much quality of friendship, but moving across to the right, increasing quality of friendship, goes together with an increasing depth of the engagement that you have with that person. So, for example, back on the top line, with strangers, you don't have very much depth of engagement with them. But as you get closer and closer to a person, your acquaintances or your colleagues, up to people you really call friends, they're the ones you have a great depth of engagement with them. Time and effort and energy and experiences. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So what are the depths of engagement? At the most shallow level, Words. Now, although it's at the, the shallow level, it, they're all important. They're all equally important, but they go deeper and deeper. So you need words. To, you've got to talk to people. Um, the words you'd share with a stranger are, are like, g'day. Uh, the words you might share with an acquaintance are, how are you going? And, and so it gets the words increase. On top of words, you get actions. And so you might do something. Uh, the shallow end, you might be helping little old ladies across the street, being kind to small furry animals. Uh, but the actions that you have with your friends are at a, at a much deeper level. You're, you're helping them out in some way. Uh, deeper than actions, because you can do actions without giving it much thought, but thoughts take you to a deeper level. Deeper than that, uh, you would share feelings with friends at a deeper level than you'd share with someone over the left-hand side of the screen. Beyond feelings, it's getting harder to read on this wall, the values that you have. Values are taking you down to something that is the driver, uh, that is the cause of how you feel and what you think and what you do. And then deepest of all, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's a bit hard to read, isn't it? Is beliefs. Our beliefs are the, the deepest level. What we truly believe then determines what we value. And what we value determines how we feel about people and things. And how we feel determines our thoughts. So beliefs, values, feelings, thoughts, actions, words. The whole point of this is it happens at a deeper level with some people, like your friends, than it does with other people, like people that you don't know at all. Okay? Now, the funny thing about this is, you can tell I like graphs. <laughs> I can't do maths, but I do like graphs and charts and diagrams. Right. Over, on the, over on the left, the number of people that you know, uh, and the number goes, can be way high. You know, sort of vaguely, lots and lots of people. You, know, you see them in the street, people you went to school with or work with or something. And <laughs> down along the bottom is the time and effort required to be in a relationship with those people. So as you spend more and more time and put more and more effort into someone, guess what happens to the number of people you engage with? It naturally falls away. Because the time and effort required to deal with a stranger is almost zero. But as you get closer and closer to home, you need to put more and more time and effort in. Which is why you can know lots of people on the left, 
but be really close to very few people. Does that make sense too? Okay, good. Now, <clears throat> it looks like this. Here is all of your time, the, your 24 hours in the day. Strangers don't take up very much of your time. By the time you add in a few acquaintances, you know, the people over the street, the, the, um, the checkout chick, the, uh, the person driving the car alongside you who needs to be instructed uh, in, in good driving technique. Look, it's just, no, that's probably strange in <laughs> order to stay that way. But the, the people that you know in the street. By the time you add in a few colleagues, can you see what's happening to your time? You've got very little time left for friends and friends are going to need to soak up a lot of time. So you've only got room and in your hours of day and energy resources to be able to have a couple of friends if you have lots of these other people in your life. Which is why men seem to have so few friends. They might have lots of acquaintances or colleagues but there's just no time left for anyone else. So the question, there's two questions. The first one is, uh, where am I in this? Uh, because one of these people in my time allocation is me. It's possible to be a complete stranger to yourself, to not know why I do the things that I do. What is it that drives me? Why am I feeling like this? Because if you're a complete stranger to yourself, you're paddling around at the shallow end of your own pool. But for those who want to put yourself in the friend group, you really know who you are. You understand yourself. You, you need to be taking up a lot of time for yourself. To be your own best friend is the best thing you can do. Someone else might need to get bumped so you can spend some time for yourself. So that's the first and important question. Where am I in this time allocation. Guess who else we're going to ask about? Where is God in this? Is God a complete stranger? Allocated very little time, if any? You have a nodding acquaintance with him, you would say occasionally get a on a Sunday. Uh, perhaps you might count him as a colleague. You'll call on his assistance uh, through the week from time to time. Is he actually your friend, that you can just hang with him, that you know him and you, you, know, you engage with him at a deep level? You've only got a certain amount of time. You, you can't be friends with everybody, so you need to choose your friends. You can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. Are you choosing to be friends with yourself? It's important. Are you choosing to be friends with God? That's important too. In the upper room, Jesus said these words. Uh, let's just break it up. First of all, my command is this. Do what? Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one this than he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus is calling us to go to the deep end of the pool, to go to the right-hand side of the screen, to go to a deeper level of engagement with him and with each other, to have deep and genuine friendships. It'll be challenging to you because you need to spend more time, more effort, more energy, be more open to your own thoughts and feelings and values and beliefs. But Jesus has modelled it as I have already done in front of you. Jesus is always the model for us. He's always the one who shows us the way and calls us to follow him. And so that's why he says, you are my friends if you do. Don't settle for just talk. Talk won't make friends. And again, it's following his words. We're, we're following what he has done. It's not just a suggestion. It's not just good advice. He's telling us we've got to do this. It's for our own good that we go into deeper and deeper engagements to move to the friend end of the scale. And it requires action. It requires 
deliberate choice. You've got to do this because it's not going to happen at a natural automatic way. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. He's going deeper and deeper from words down to actions to thoughts to feelings to values to beliefs to know one another to open up and to pursue at a deeper level and again he models it for us he's done it we need to follow the path that he has done if we're going to be friendly if we're going to develop friendships then Jesus is a great way to learn how to do that back in the Old Testament there was Abraham who was called by this very rare title a friend of God why is he a friend of God because Abraham did what he believed God and where does belief sit in all the ways that we grow a relationship it's right down at the very deepest level it's deeper than words actions thoughts feelings and values right down to the belief what drives more than anything else and he became God's friend because he operated at that deep level so all that's just introduction now now let's come to our text <laughs> that was helpful for for background to see in Mark chapter 9 that Jesus and me the closer we get to each other the more I get I benefit out of being closer to Jesus. I benefit by being a friend of Jesus. Our text says, They left that place where they were for the Mount of Transfiguration and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He was moving away from the left-hand side of the screen, the crowds, the acquaintances, the, the, all of those people to have contact with fewer people as he moves towards the right. Small digression. You may know the book by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. I'm just going to explore this for a bit. Very popular. The Five Love Languages have been translated into more languages than I knew existed and had more spin-off into how various groups of people can learn these languages. And these are the, the languages. They're not in any particular order. They just are all five, and they're all useful in their own ways. Spending quality time with people is a, a great way to... Well, you need to, to get to the right-hand end of the screen. Quality time is a, a language of love. Words of affirmation reaching out and grabbing with physical touch hugs the giving and receiving of gifts flowers chocolates no pressure on anyone at this point <laughs> which would be a great act of service of lending a helping hand each of those are the ways in which we communicate with someone close to us. And so it, it works a bit like this. You have a language that you speak when you talk to someone close to you. The person that you're speaking to also has their own love language. They're not necessarily the same. And so when you are speaking to someone close to you, you will naturally speak your own love language but if that's not the language you've got a one in five chance only of the message getting through you need to not only speak your language so that you're true to yourself you also need to speak the language of the person to whom you're trying to communicate otherwise they won't hear you you can speak words or, or deeds or acts or any other way of showing love but if that's not their language they're not going to hear love at all and so we're in this constant mode 
of translating our own words, translating in English in some other way so that we get to communicate to the people close to us. Uh, very often, you know, let's, let's drop into the counselling mode. Counsellors see that even within the own, your own household, people who truly love each other sometimes can't stand each other and don't communicate with one another because they're speaking a different language. All too many of you know that firsthand. So in our text, Jesus, who's been using all the languages to speak to his disciples, comes at this time and the priority that he has is that he wants to give quality time to his disciples. He shuts out everyone else. All those needs, all those opportunities, all those crying desires that people have, all those people who need help. He shuts the door and says, no, I'm not going to do it. And he withdraws from them in order to give quality time to his disciples. That was more important at the moment. And if you're going to build relationships, if you're going to be friends, then you have to say no to some people so that you can put more time and effort and energy, resources, into the people that you're going to have as your friend. Now, these love languages function best in very close relationships. They work at home. They, they work in a family-sized church like us. The five love languages can be spoken here very effectively. Uh, but in other places, like your work environment, won't be so useful. Mega churches, chaplaincies, they're different styles of ministry. Just to do a, a, a quick diversion. I read a survey this week of US employees, uh, a huge range of organisations. Less than half of them, 49%, of these employees were actually engaged in their work. They loved to get up and go to work in the morning. Most people didn't. Most people said, oh no, where's the weekend? And of these 51% who were not, who were not engaged, who were disengaged, 17% were actually actively disengaged. They were more trouble than they were worth. You've probably worked with people like that. So. How do you deal with, with people in the outside this environment? Very quickly, now this is not, not dropping into management consultant mode, but you can perhaps uh, apply this outside church. You need to value each other. The first thing you do is if you can value someone, and again, in ways that they understand, it will be useful. And then as you value someone, it builds trust, the relationship increases and that trust allows feedback to happen. You can talk to one another. It's not just a up and down relationship. It becomes a side by side relationship and they begin to motivate themselves. They, they like the work environment that they're in and so they value themselves. They value the work and they value other employees. But that's a bit of a sidetrack. Let's come back to our text and our five love languages. The priority for Jesus is quality time. So let's extend that from Jesus and the disciples to us. How do you have quality time with God yourself? And as Steve's already indicated, he didn't know this was coming, but prompted by the Spirit, he talked about our quiet time in the service. So when you spend some time with God, how do you do that? And how do the five love languages help? Briefly, you need to make time. If you don't make time to spend with God, I'll give you three guesses what's going to happen. You only need one, don't you? If you don't make time, the time doesn't happen. Lock it in. Put it in your diary. Otherwise, he misses out. And then you need to read scripture. You need to listen to what God has to say. Some people like reading through the entire Bible in a year. Take you about five chapters a day. Useful exercise. Some people like to read about five words a day. 
It's an equally useful exercise. As long as we are listening to what God has got to say. And then reach out and touch him. Touch his heart and allow him to touch your heart. Man, Steve's indicated the songs that we sing, take them with you into your quiet time. They will be just a source of blessing to offer your praise to him. And then thanksgiving. You cannot say thank you too often, either to God or to the people that you're trying to be close to. Even complete strangers will uh, appreciate some words of affirmation and a thank you is one of the easiest things that you can give. So as that, the things that you need to ask but they're secondary to saying thanks. And then finally, how am I going to be different when I get up and walk away from this little time that I've had with God? What do I need to do that is going to be transformative for myself? How am I going to live differently? How am I going to be more Christ-like? What am I going to do to make a difference around me? So here's a way of, as Jesus and I get, the closer we get, the more I get, I benefit. Let's come into the second part, the second verse of our three. Jesus and me, the more I know, the more I understand. And it's as this knowledge, this relationship with him grows to be deeper and closer, the more I'm going to benefit. This, this, it's not purely selfish, but we are the ones who benefit out of getting closer to him. Now, how do you get to heaven? Uh, here's a little test. Uh, this is the mental arithmetic section, question 27. If Moses is twice as old as Joshua when he weighed half as much as Miriam, how much will Moses weigh when he's two years younger than Miriam when she weighed 14 kilograms less than Joshua? <laughs> now remember, this is mental arithmetic. This is actually... It's a trick question because it's actually not part of the entrance test to get into heaven. <laughs> Thank God, yes, you're quite right. Knowledge of you... It, is useful. The knowledge of scripture is very useful. It will help you every day, literally every day. But better than knowledge is understanding. And better than the understanding, the get it, is the relationship that we have. And that's the only test of getting to heaven. Are you in a relationship with Jesus? That gets you there. Now, <clears throat> what do we understand and what does Jesus understand well Jesus understands friends and foes alike that's why he understands what you're going through he understands the people that you have to interact with every day he understands both friends and foes because he had them in abundance he said to them the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men this doesn't sound good news going to be handed over to people who were totally fickle who could one day pretend to be friends but certainly failed the friendship test became foes and you know that for yourself you have been through experiences that have been unpleasant to say the very least you know what it is to be hurt and to be harmed. Jesus understands that. And that's why scripture says, we do have a high priest who is able to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, what we have suffered. We have one who's been tested in every way, just as we are. And yet he didn't sin. He's been there, he struggled through it and he's come out on top and he shows us what to do. He carries us forward. He opens up the way for us. So the people that you have to deal with every day, no names, but some of them are just a pain in the backside. And... <laughs> Suddenly everyone's awake and nodding. Oh yeah, yeah, no names, no names. 
Be because they tread on your toes all the way. But hang on, hang on. What if you were to look at those same painful, irritating people and see them as God sees them? Maybe you would see them perhaps just a little differently because they're going through their own hard times as well and they're struggling with the own, their own issues and they do need what only God is able to bring them. What's going to disappoint you? Well, <clears throat> when your expectations are bigger than reality, you're going to be disappointed. I have this little thing that I do and it's got nothing to do with the picture. <laughs> and I just assume that most people in the world are morons. <laughs> and... And I'm never disappointed. Look, politicians. I have never expected a politician to do the right thing and I've never been disappointed. It's not that we should set low expectations, but for ourselves we should set the very highest of expectations. Our expectations need to somehow tune in with reality. Of all the things that could happen to you, this day, um, the whole range of possibilities from you know, an earthquake swallowing you up as you're halfway home through till well, the second coming. Uh, there's a huge range of things that could happen. What's most likely to happen is that, apart from the second coming being imminent, is that we'll have a slap up morning tea <laughs> and it's going to be good. And we need to have an optimistic attitude. We're following Jesus. Yes, he knows about friends and foes. He knows what it is to be hurt. He knows what it is to be betrayed by those who are close to him. But still, he's moving towards the best outcome because Jesus understands life and death. Not only will he be delivered into the hands of men, they will kill him. This is not good news. He understands life and death because he has been there and he didn't just die. It's not just that he went to bed and fell asleep. He was killed. He was murdered. He was flogged. He was abused. He died a horrible, horrible death. Crushed by people who thought nothing of him or were out to do as much harm as they possibly could. Jesus understands life and death. And so our daily walk with Jesus is walking with the one who's been crucified, the one who has suffered, the one who understands what it is to live in this life, the one who understands what it is to die. And he carries his cross, we carry our cross. It's the place that will take us to where we die to self. But beyond that, the good news, the best news, is Jesus understands the big picture because there's more to friends and foes. There's more to life and death. The big picture is, as Jesus said, he will rise again. There is more to life than this world can possibly offer. This world has got some wonderful opportunities and great things that happen and it's full of lovely people. But this world is temporary and everything in it is temporary and the people around are temporary and the hurts and the joys are all temporary. There is something better that we're moving to and we must never lose our heavenly perspective. Jesus rose again and so too will we. So the more I know, the more I get. And then briefly and lastly, the deeper I dig, the higher I rise. This is what it is to be in relationship with Jesus. Jesus and me, the deeper I dig, the higher I rise. The deeper I go down those layers of levels of friendship, the higher I will rise with him. They didn't understand what he meant and they were afraid to ask him about it. They'd, they'd been together at least three years and still they're not understanding and still they're afraid. You can see a couple of things here, or two things. First of all, Jesus wants to get inside my head. He wants my head. 
they did not understand was the problem. And quite frankly, look, you've been Christians for how long? You've been reading the Bible for how long? How much do you understand? I know whenever I open the Bible, I read something, I thought, oh, I didn't know that was there. We're discovering new stuff all the time. It's no wonder that they didn't understand. Don't give them too hard a time. Now, Mark Twain, who could not by any stretch of the imagination be considered a Christian, did make lots and lots of comments about the Bible. I suspect he actually read it quite a bit. He did say this, paraphrased, It's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. The parts of the Bible that bother me are the parts that I do understand. Don't worry about the bits you don't understand. There'll always be those bits. Are you bothered by the bits you understand? The calls that Jesus has on our lives? It's all very easy to fall into, oh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And they're wonderfully comforting words. But sometimes we need to go to the challenge. Love one another as I have loved you. Or, you know, let's see, there's some lovely, the loveliest people here are. <laughs> Don't get into too much trouble. And it's easy to love some people, but we're to love as Jesus loved, and he loved even Judas. Can we do that? And so we read in Scripture, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. That's the mind. That's the understanding. He wants to get inside our head and to, to govern and guide our thoughts, our attitude. And then lastly, Jesus wants my heart. He wants to be in my heart and reign in my heart and rule through my heart. He wants my heart. So, but we read, but they were afraid. Even still they were afraid. And we need to give Jesus what we can't control what we can't understand because fear is so crippling fear is just a big hole into which it's possible to fall and we can climb out of that as we give even our fears to Jesus the 23rd Psalm goes on to say even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me doesn't matter where we go. And we'll go into difficult and fearful times. Nevertheless, we have his comfort with us always. So Jesus wants to be your friend. He is available to be your friend. He is constantly there as your friend. But we need to invite him into our friendship by making time, by taking the effort, and to speaking to him in our love language and hearing back in ours. Friends share what's on their minds and what's in their hearts. Jesus wants to get inside my head and inside my heart because of all the things that Jesus is and he is so many things, these and so many more. He's also my best friend. And when we live Jesus as my best friend then everything else will change as well let me pray Father thank you for the friendship that you grant to us in the Lord Jesus thank you that he's a friend a forever friend a friend who will never leave us nor forsake us a friend who will transform our lives but Lord we confess that we've not been very friendly to him we confess that we have neglected our relationship. Thank you for forgiving us for that. But now we want to draw closer to you, to go deeper into a relationship with you and to find that all that you are will transform all that we are for today, tomorrow and forever. Thank you for these blessings in Jesus' name, our best friend. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. 
Here's our song of response and how appropriate this is. Thank you, Lord. For all you've done for us, Lord, what can we do but say thank you, thank you to you for who you are, for what you do, what you've done, and what you will do. Thank you that Jesus befriends each one of us and allows us to be his friends. Now may the Lord bless you, keep you, care for you, provide for you, and again and again, Open your eyes to see what a friend we have in Jesus. Until next time, God bless you. Goodbye.